So what are proteins? Well, proteins are one of the, the biomolecules that I spoke of before when we, I told you we were talking, to be talking about biomolecules. I was talking about, when I was talking about that then, I was talking about those four um, uh, carbohydrates, lipids, uh, and then proteins. And then I think last time I said there were three, I made a mistake there. There's actually four. The last one is nucleic acids. So the four types of biomolecules that we'll, we, we've been, that we're studying in and are going to study are the lipids, the carbohydrates, the, the proteins or amino acids, and then the nucleic acids, right? So we've already done the carbohydrates, we've already done the lipids, now we're gonna do the proteins. And then after the proteins, we'll do the nucleic acids. Um, so what are proteins? Well, proteins are made up of essential amino acids, right? And a regular, and regular amino acids. Uh, they do plenty of things in your body and every other living organism's body um, and they are basically 3d models of a bunch of amino acids that have come together right to form this big 3d uh, molecule three-dimensional molecule right uh, that performs some type of function right whether that would be a structural function or an enzymatic function uh, catalysis function proteins are what we use to do things with right so let's just quickly go through the formal stuff about proteins here right they're made of they're polymers of amino acids right the 20 uh, when I was in grad school I actually not just grad school undergrad too uh, one of the things we had to do was memorize all 20 amino acids plus the two extra ones and then also their uh, first letter or their single letter uh, designations, the three-letter designations, and a bunch of other stuff. But don't worry, I'm not going to make you memorize all 20 amino acids, plus two. Um, but yes, they are polymers made of the 20 different amino acids. Uh, a few of them are essential because your body can't actually make them yourself, make them themselves, right? There's a process in our bodies called uh, amino acid uh, metabolism, uh, and we can make some amino acids ourselves, uh, but most of the amino acids that we need are essential and we get them from eating things like meat right or soybeans if that's what you want to do or drinking in them from milk and stuff um so the different characteristics because uh the functions of each proteins differ because they may, they're made up of different amino acids, right? Different combinations of amino acids that have different, like, our, our side chains. Remember what I was talking about before? How amino acids, not amino acids, but molecules have, the, like, a, uh, a center part of them. And then there's an R for the rest of the molecule. Well, it's the same thing with amino acids. Um, so, uh, with those amino acids, there's 20 different variations. And then you can get an infinite number of them put together in multiple in 20 different variations and those all will interact differently providing you with a very diverse set of functions and 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 and, and structural capabilities for, for proteins right and that's delineated here because you can actually make structural components like cartilage muscle hair nails right or they can do uh, the enzymes which we'll get to in the next lecture uh, my my specialty in biochemistry is actually enzymology. And it's interesting because we're only going to spend one lecture on enzymology or like enzymes, uh, which is like maybe less than an hour on it. But there's an entire class called enzymology and enzyme catalysis. And one of my professors uh, was actually, uh, he was the student of the enzyme of, en <laughs> sorry, I said that wrong. He was my, one of my professors when I was in grad school was the student of the uh, father of enzyme kinetics, Mo Cleland, who was uh, up in the University of Wisconsin. Him and Perry Fry and a couple other people at the, uh, at the uh, uh, University of Wisconsin uh, wrote the book on enzyme kinetics. And, uh, and so I, I'm very proud to be a part of that pedigree, you know, that lineage from Mo Cleland to um, my boss at grad school, who is Steve Mansarabadi, and then me. Uh, I was actually able to publish a paper with Perry Fry, who is also another one of those biochemistry enzyme uh, enzyme uh, enzymology you know moguls too, and and it was very 
I was very proud of that. So, anyway, the point is, you can take an entire semester class on enzymology, whole textbooks on enzymology, but we're only going to cover it in one lecture. Um, but that's okay, though. I'll, I'll give you what you need to know about it. But yes, what are enzymes? Enzymes are... Catal are, are uh, uh, are responsible for biological cat catalysis, right? So what they are, they're a biological catalyst, which means they speed up reactions, right? Or more specifically, they'll, these enzymes are proteins, and they will make it so that the activation energy, if you remember from a previous lecture, uh, they'll make it where uh, an activate, the activation energy of a particular biological reaction that's required for you to live um, doesn't require as much activation energy so it can actually proceed, right? And we'll see that in a second. Um, and just another example, hemoglobin and myoglobin, myoglobin they're proteins too, and they transport oxygen in the blood. Uh, that was actually, I believe, one of my first examples for you. Uh, uh, hemoglobin and the heme with the iron center, and it will bind oxygen, right? So I, I think I, I, I believe that was the very first uh, example I ever gave you uh, for uh, enzymes. You know, it's like maybe the first lecture. Wow, that was a long time ago. So, let's just quickly go through some of this stuff here. There are classes of proteins, right? There are structural proteins, um, which is obvious. They provide structural components, like collagen, uh, which is in tendons and cartilage, like in your nose. Uh, and then there's keratin, which is hair. Um, it's uh, in the, you know, in your nails. There's also contractile proteins. They make your muscles move, like myosin and actin. Transport proteins, uh, hemoglobin, which is the uh, one that transports oxygen throughout your body. And then uh, lipoproteins, which we were talking about in the last lecture. Uh, high density lipoproteins lipoprotein, and low density lipoproteins, right? There, there are those. And then there's storage proteins too. Uh, casein for proteins of the milk and ferritin, right? which fer ferritin is, you know, like ferrous or ferric, you know, like iron. So it stores iron in the spleen and liver. There are hormones. There are proteins that are hormones, right? Um, one of those is uh, uh, insulin. Insulin is actually a very short, uh, insulin is a very short, sorry about that. Uh, my dog is in the room with me right now. He's sleeping. His name's Yogi, and he was making some really loud noises. And I'm like, like Yogs? Yogi? You okay? My dog's name's Yogi, if I didn't say that already. So I had to make sure he was okay. He's okay. I think he was having a nightmare or something. Anyway, back to this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So there are hormone proteins, too. Uh, one of them is insulin, right? Uh, insulin is a very short peptide, which you'll learn what a peptide is. It's just uh, a peptide is a is a string or a, poly a polymer of amino acids. And uh, and that's what insulin is, it's a short string of amino acids. And if you recall from our previous lecture before that, we, uh, insulin is responsible for um, uh, signaling your body to store glucose, right? And then, of course, we have enzymes, which I already talked about. Oh, there are all kinds of enzymes, like sucrase, which hydrolyzes sucrose. Trypsin, which hydrolyzes proteins, which means breaks them apart uh, using water. Um, and then their protection, which is uh, they recognize and destroy uh, foreign thing, uh, foreign substances like your the ones in your immune system, right? Your immune system. Those are like the immuno immunoglobulins, right? Which are just their antibodies, which are responsible for identifying antigens uh, in your immune system. Um, so. I like to actually break this down even more simply into the fact that there are two types of proteins. There are structural proteins, right? And then there are functional proteins, right? And the functional proteins are all enzymes. They do a process, right? They, they carry out some kind of process. Whereas the structural proteins are, are the ones that are like, you know, they make the structure in a body or a cell, right? So... So that's how I like to categorize them. They're either functional proteins or they're, 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 they're structural proteins, okay? So even, for example, you know, you have structural proteins here, um, the first one, but then you have contractile transport proteins, right? Uh, all that stuff after this, after structural, they're all functions, <laughs> right? They're all functional proteins. 
So you have the one structural protein right here, but then all these guys here I would consider functional proteins because they carry out some kind of purpose. Right? And then the main functional protein, the main functional protein is the enzyme, right? The enzyme, which we spent a lot of time talking about enzymes. Wow, that was a lot of time spent on this particular slide. Let's keep going. <laughs> so uh, I was talking about amino acids in the last slide. What are amino acids? So basically amino acid is composed of this thing right here called an alpha carbon. It's also like a, the central carbon of the molecule, right? And connected to that is one hydrogen, which is right there. It's always there, right? And then on one side is an amino group or ammonium group, right? Which we call the N-terminal side, N for ammonium, right? And then terminal because it's at the end. And then on the other side, we have a carboxylate, right? Which we call the C-terminal side, right? Because it's got a C for carbon, right? And then last but not least, because there are four bonds to carbon, right? We have the R group. And remember what I said, what an R group was, it's the rest of the molecule, right? So for um, this particular protein here, right? The R group is a methyl group, right? So that yellow thing right there, the yellow part, that methyl group there, the R group is the part of amino acids that's variable, right? I mean, you're only learning about 20 amino acids here, right? I mean, I'm not even sure if I'll go through all 20. No, I will go through all 20. You're only learning about the 20 amino acids here, but there's multiple amino acids. There are alpha amino acids, which are what these are, because everybody's everything's coming off of the alpha carbon. There's beta amino acids coming off the second carbon. Um, <clears throat> there's also modifications on the 20 original amino acids too so there's a lot more than just 20 amino acids but in this class we're only going to focus on the 20 and in all those 20 this one right here the r group is different on all of them so here's some examples we have valine here right and valine's r group right is this ch ch3 ch3 right this alkyl group right whereas on asparagine the R group is the CH2 and then the amide group, right? This amide right here, right? So those are two different um, amino acids right there. Valine and every other amino acid has a three letter designation. One of them is val, uh, for valine it's val, V-A-L. It also has a one letter, designa one letter designation, which is V for valine. Uh, we hope, we wish that they were all this, just the first letter of the, <laughs> the first letter of the amino acid's name, but it's not. Uh, so here we have asparagine. Its three-letter designation is ASN, and its one-letter designation is N, right? Not A. And I picked these particular two because valine here is nonpolar because, like I was saying, it has an alkyl group, carbons and hydrogens right there, right? Whereas asparagine is polar because it has this carbonyl group, remember? And in the carbonyl group, everything is partially, pos po partially positive over here at the carbon, right? And partially negative over there at the oxygen. So that would be a polar amino acid, right? And remember, the rest of it stays the same. Here's the N-terminal side, which is the amino acid side of the valine, the carboxylic acid side, or the C-terminal side of, the, uh, of it, and then there's the hydrogen. Same thing here right there and there so just remember that um every amino acid has that same basic structure amine on the alpha carbon carboxylate on the alpha carbon and hydrogen on the alpha carbon right and then the r group which is also on the alpha carbon right so talking about nonpolar and polar amino acids that alludes us to the next a set of slides. We have a number of nonpolar amino acids, right? Um, and those are basically the ones that are uh, that have mostly hydrocarbons in them, right? So the first nonpolar amino acid is glycine. Its R group is just the hydrogen, right? Uh, its three-letter designation is GYL, 
<laughs> G-L-Y. And then it's one letter designation is just G, right? So that was pretty easy. Hydrogen as an R group, glycine, G-L-Y, and then G. Next one, the methyl group, right? That's alanine. We saw that in the previous slide. Three letter designation is A-L-A. And one letter designation is just A for alanine, right? One letter designation. We already saw valine on the previous slide. That's nonpolar, right? Because it has an alkyl group right here. Here's another alkyl group, a larger alkyl group, leucine. Its group, its three letter designation is LEU. And its um, one letter designation is L, right? And it has got a CH2, CH, CH3 on both ends right there, right? So basically, leucine is the same thing as valine, right? Leucine here is the same thing as valine, right? Except that it has an extra methyl in there, right? It has an extra methyl. And then we have isoleucine. Well, remember what ISO means when you put it in front of a molecule's name. It means that it's the same molecule uh, uh, formula, mo molecular formula, right? It's just structurally different, right? So how how is isoleucine's R group the same as leucine's, right? And how is it different? Well, for one thing, isoleucine has three carbons in a row, right? Right after the alpha carbon, there's one, two, three. It's the same thing with leucine. One, two, three. Three. The difference between those two, though, is that the methyl group coming off comes off from this carbon the first. Uh, comes up, comes off comes from that carbon, the one is the, the one that's right adjacent to the alpha carbon in isoleucine. Whereas in leucine, the methyl group comes off of the second carbon from the alpha carbon, right? So basically the same molecule, uh, 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 formula-wise, but structurally only differing by the position of that one methyl group, one carbon away, right? Right? Its three-letter designation is I-L-E, and its one-letter designation is L. Oh, sorry, not L, I, right? Leucine is I. Yeah, we had to measure, we had to memorize all of these. There's more, 20 total when I was an undergrad, but I don't think I'm going to make you memorize those structures, so you should be fine. But just know, you know, the, the properties and know the structures and what they mean and all that stuff. But you don't actually have to memorize, memorize. Like, I'm, not, I'm never going to ask you to draw out one of these things, right? Just from memory. Um, let's see here. Next, we have phenylalanine, which is actually my favorite amino acid. I know that's kind of nerdy. To have a, have a favorite amino acid, right? Um, but this is my favorite. If I ever have a bonus question and I ask you, what's my favorite amino acid? Uh, it's phenylalanine. Same uh, core right here, right? The amino alpha carbon carboxylate with the hydrogen and the R group is got a CH2 and a benzene ring, right? Well, why do you think they call it phenylalanine then, right? What's, what's another word for benzene ring? It's phenyl. Remember that from when we were talking about hydrocarbons? Phenyl, right? And then, what is it when you have just the methyl group right there off the alpha carbon? Well, it's called an alanine, right? Phenylalanine. Let me just tell you that biochemists are really simple, right? We, <laughs> we tend to name things uh, pretty much uh, self-explanatorily, right? And you'll even find later on when we get to the enzymes, we literally name enzymes based on what they do, right? So uh, one of the enzymes I'll talk about a little bit later um, uh, is called luciferase that I studied back in, back in grad school. And luciferase, uh, luci, is actually Greek for the word light, right? And so race means enzyme, or sorry, not race, but ACE, A-C-E. So it acts on a molecule called luciferin, right? So that's why we call it luciferase, because luciferin is a light-generating molecule, right? That's why it's called luciferin. And this enzyme acts on that molecule to make it make light. 
and so we call it luciferase. So you'll see a pattern in which the substrate for the enzyme is always called, is always the, the name of the molecule itself, and then the enzyme that acts on that substrate is its name plus ace at the end, right? We're that simple as biochemists, and you'll see that in a minute. Next, we have a methionine. Methionine has two methyls, right, right there, plus a sulfur and then another methyl at the end. That's methionine. Oh, I forgot to say, the three-letter uh, three letter designation for phenylalanine is PHE, and you would think it would be P for the first letter uh, for one letter designation, but it's not. It's F. F is the one letter designation for phenylalanine. All right. Let's jump to methionine now. Methionine again, through two methyl groups to sulfur to a a uh, another methyl group. Right. And that's methionine. It's got. MET as its um, uh, as its three letter designation, and uh, M as its uh, single letter designation or one letter designation. Methionine is very special, uh, so we'll talk about this a little bit more in the nucleic acids. But uh, nucleic acids are basically DNA, right? And a DNA sequence compo is composed of codons, and those codons are basically a series of three DNA molecules. At a time, right? Or three nitrogenous bases at nucleic acids at a time, right? They correspond to three other ones called anticodons, right? And then those three anticodons attach to an amino acid. And so when you read a DNA molecule, like a strand of DNA, you read them three at a time, right? And every three will code for an amino acid. Well, methionine, right? Its codon. It actually codes for start, which means that if you have a methionine at the very beginning as the coded amino acid for a DNA strand, what that means is that you need to start making a protein, right? That's a start protein, right? And there's also an end protein, to, uh, sorry. There's also an end amino, uh, end sequence too. It doesn't have a, uh, it doesn't have a, an amino acid attached to it, but it's an end sequence. I believe it's, I'm not a geneticist, but I'm pretty sure it's TGA, right? We'll talk more about that later, but I just want you to know that methionine is special. It's known as the stop codon. Sorry, known as the start codon, right? Start codon. Next, we have proline. Proline is special too. Its three-letter designation is pro, P-R-O. One-letter designation is P. But it's special because it's the only amino acid that has its alkyl group come back around and reattach to the amine group, making this five-membered ring, right? So that makes it really rigid, right? It makes it really rigid. It doesn't get to spin as much. The rest of these guys, they're all on single bonds, right, to the alpha carbon. All these R groups are on alpha bonds. Uh, all these R groups are on uh, sigma bonds, right, to the, uh, to the alpha carbon, right? And so if you remember from when we were talking about uh, this stuff in uh, the alpha, the uh, hydrocarbon section, uh, when you have when you have uh, two atoms around a sigma bond, right, uh, or a single bond, I'm sorry, I'm saying sigma, but I meant single, around a single bond, they spin freely. So all the R groups up until proline, they were all on single bonds to the alpha carbon, and so they spin freely, they have a lot of freedom. Proline, though, since it wraps around, its alkyl group wraps around and reattaches is right there at the amine, right? It's very rigid. It doesn't spin freely. It doesn't spin very freely, right? And then we have tryptophan. <laughs> this is the same tryptophan that everybody thinks makes you sleepy um, uh, when you eat turkey, right? And it's, it, it's our group is the methyl, of course, again, in between. And then we have a benzene ring with a five-membered ring, right, with a hydrogen. All right, so that's tryptophan. Tryptophan's three-letter designation, CRP, and this is hard to remember. Um, <laughs> it's uh, uh, single-letter designation is W. <laughs> I promise the only reason why it's like that is because uh, T was already used for something else. That's why. All right, let's keep on going. We now have we have the polar amino acids, right? Here's serine. Serine is actually very special. Serine is uh, is always a part of uh, of uh, things called 
the active site of an enzyme. And we'll talk more about that in the enzyme lecture next, right? But know that serine's important. Serines, our group, is a methyl plus an OH. And if it's an OH, right, the oxygen makes it super uh, polar. Really easy three-letter designation. S-E-R, really easy uh, single-letter designation, right? I'm not going to make you, like, actually draw out any of these, you know, uh, like on a test, draw out any of these amino acids or something, but you'll still have to be able to tell me what the three-letter designations are and the, uh, the one-letter designations are, or maybe see these amino acid structures and kind of know what they are, right? But you don't have to actually draw them out, but from memory. Next, oh, that's where the T went. That's theranine. Theranine is the same thing, right, as serine, except it has a CH3 methyl group coming off of that beta carbon, right, or that second carbon from the alpha carbon. Then we have tyrosine, right, another polar one because of this OH up here. It has a benzene ring in between the OH and the little methyl group right there, tyrosine, T-Y-R, and Y as its um, uh, uh, single letter designation. We have cysteine here. Cysteine is very important too. Cysteine forms these things called disulfide bonds. They're one of the covalent interactions that holds proteins together, right? Two of them can get to get together and oxidize and become a disulfide bond, which we'll talk about together. We'll talk about it in a second, right? And that will hold proteins together pretty permanently. And so that's CH2 uh, with an SH. So remember I was talking about the father of enzyme kinetics, Mo Cleland, right? Uh, he actually was the very first scientist to ever use a molecule called dithiothreatol. Uh, it's actually DTT. Uh, it's, uh, it's commonly known as Cleland's reagent, right? And he was the first one to use DTT, right, to reduce these disulfide bonds right here, right, to separate cysteines in a... In a, uh, in a uh, in a protein, right, or an enzyme. So he has that name, Cleland's reagent. He was a, he was able to use that DTT, and so now he's got a, a, a entire a, a chemical, a very important chemical named after him, Cleland's reagent. Um, and I'm a part of that lineage, right, because Cleland was my boss's boss, and then my boss is my boss, right. So um, yeah, that was pretty cool. Sadly, though, Mo Cleland died a few years ago. Um, we found out. You know, but it's very sad. Anyway, he died while I was still in grad school, so I guess it was more than a few years ago. It was before 2016, somewhere between 2012 and 2016. I can't remember the exact date. Anyway, um, next one is asparagine, right? Asparagine is got the amide, right? along with the CH2, and then we have glutamine, right, which also has the amide with the CH2, but it has an extra CH2, right, making it a little bit longer. All these are, are, are polar, of course, right, all these are polar. And so, if you remember, we had asparagine in the previous slide, and uh, ASN and N are its designations, and then for glutamine, GLN, and Q for its designations. Wow, Q, that's hard. Q for glutamine. Right. But just remember, though, if, you, if you're having trouble remembering it, asparagine and glutamine are basically the same thing, except that glutamine has one extra carbon, or one extra CH2, right? Um, serine and theranine, right, and tyrosine and cysteine are all the same, right, from there down, okay, just that serine has an OH, theranine has a CH3 extra and an OH, The tyrosine has a phenol group. I don't think I ever told you that before. When you ever have your, whenever you have a phenol with an OH, it's called a phenol, right? And then uh, cysteine has the SH. So you can you can start to glean the fact that I used to glean twice now. That's weird. In one lecture, 
anyway, you can glean the fact that, uh, and some insight into that, in this, that amino acids are very similar to each other. They just have, just have slightly different R groups, right? Even past the R, past the beta carbon, right? And that's how I memorize them, right? Let's keep going. We have acidic amino acids too, right? Um, and uh, the acidic amino acids, or aspartate, sorry, lost my train of thought for a second there, or aspartate and glutamate, right? Now, what does that sound like? That sounds a lot like the previous slide where we had, oh, sorry, previous, previous, there we go, where we had asparagine and glutamine, right? Whereas where asparagine and glutamine had an amide there, right? Aspartate and glutamate are exactly the same thing, except instead of having an amide, they have carboxylic acids there. It's specifically, it's a carboxylate, right? It's not a carboxylic acid, but it's a carboxylate ion, right? Those are the acidic amino acids. Why is the carboxylate? Just a quick review, because there's no hydrogen there. There's just a minus sign. Makes it a carboxylate on both. Aspartate, ASP, and D. Glutamate, GLU, G -U, G -L -U, and E, right? Now you know why the other ones didn't have, like, you know, regular uh, three-letter designations that were, like, based on their name. It's close, though. Next, we have the basic amino acids. We have histidine. Histidine is a very important one. We used to do this thing, or we still do do this thing, where we put a six-histidine tag on any protein that we're trying to make, or enzyme we're trying to synthesize. And we can use that six-histidine protein, or six-histidine in a row's, uh, six histidines in a row to purify that protein or enzyme from the cell lysate, right? Because this is very, this is very, very, you know, rare that you have six of these in a row right here, six histidines. And histidines are a nitrogen-based five-member ring on a CH2, right? With the positive charge on that nitrogen and two hydrogens, right? That's histidine. That's histidine. Okay. And that's just the um, thing. Clear that real quick because I got a little messy. There we go. There we go. Let's pause the charge on that nitrogen. All right. So what does that actually mean then? At a physiological pH, this hydrogen can actually go back and forth from being there, and that's why there's a positive charge right there. And so sometimes you'll see histidine without this hydrogen on there, and that plus sign is gone because the plus sign is only there when there's four bonds to nitrogen right easy to remember his as a three letter designation h for the one letter designation next leucine super long alkyl chain right from the alpha carbon and then a ammonium at the end all right with an ammonium at the end lysine lys and k and the arginine just a little bit more, little tiny bit more complicated. Another long alkyl chain, and then in this NH group here, and this NH group here, with this carbon in the center and the acidic slash basic basic part there, right? Acidic slash basic part there. Arginine, arge, it's the three-letter designation. Arg, 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 maybe, ah, oh yeah, arg, that's better. Arg, like a pirate, right? And then R is its single letter designation, right? And those are the four different, um, those are the four different uh, groups of amino acids. So expect questions on the exam that are like, is this a polar amino acid? Is this a um, uh, acidic amino acid? Is this a non-polar amino acid? You know, those kinds of things. I've already gone over this before. Uh, but just a quick review, you know, we have aspartic acid here, or aspartate here, and it's not aspartic acid, it's aspartate, because they're, the, um, the, uh, it's a carboxylate, right? But anyway, you know, I've already gone over this, right? This part here is the R group, and then every single amino acid has the, um, NH3 plus to the alpha carbon, H to the carboxylate right that might not look like a carboxylate but that's the same thing as doing this 
right? And that may not look like an amine over there, an ammonium right there, but it could also be this. You can also draw it this way. Right? Yep. Same thing here, look, uh, you see the asparagine, right? I already said that before, same thing as aspartate, except it's an amide instead of a carboxylate, right? So when you're drawing amino acids, not to say that you will have to draw amino acids, but if you ever draw an amino acid, just remember you have to have this part first. That is the most important part of the amino acid. Well, I'm sorry, it's not the most important part, but it's the backbone of the amino acid. And then the R, the R group is the important part of the amino acid because that's the business end. That's what does things. Some don't do anything at all, actually. So amino acid practice. We're drawing valine. I actually like to remember. I remember valine because valine V. I think <laughs> I think that uh, the biochemists um, draw valine and they and the or they saw the molecule valine and they they were like, oh look, it makes the shape of a V. That must be what valine is. Let's just name it valine. So it's pretty simple to draw valine. Always start out with the backbone. Right, or the, the, the alpha carbon part, and then draw the rest of it. Right, and that's failing. Well, I kind of, I messed up a little there because there should be carbons there. I went from uh, expanded, <laughs> expanded formula to line angle there. That's bad. Let me, let me do that again for you. Bad habits as a biochemist, sorry. There we go. Bad habits. Draw them really fast. Right? Like that. And then CH2. CH3. CH3. Right? And this is at physiological pH. This is what it is going to be a physiological pH. Positive charge which an extra, with an extra hydrogen on the, uh, uh, on the amino group. Ammonium group and then a uh, negative charge without the minus, uh, without the hydrogen on the carboxylate, right? Write the three letter, three, letter, three letter designation, easy. VAL for valine. And luckily for us, valine is the only one that's V, so it has the V as its three single letter designation. Next, we have cysteine, another simple one. NH3, whoops. H3, if I can get this N out, there we go, and then the rest of the alpha carbon part of the amino acid, right? And it's just the CH2 with the OH. Oops, not OH. I read, did that wrong. Look, see, I, even I make mistakes. It's SH. Oh man, Mo Cleland would be so upset with me for that because that's what he uses to to do disulfide bonds, or at least reduces these disulfide bonds, right? Right. So um, CYS is the cyst. No, <laughs> there we go. CYS is the three-letter designation, and uh, I think C is the. Uh, is the single letter designation. Let me think about that for a second. Yes, I think that is C. I'll come back and fix this if it's not. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. So, I've been talking about this a lot and I've never really showed you what it was. Uh, peptides, right? What are peptides? Well, peptides are a string of amino acids that are linked together by what we call a peptide bond, right? So here we have a glycine and an alanine right there. This is the glycine right here, all right? And this is the alanine right here, okay? And it's being held together by this bond right here. That's the amide bond, right? I mean, sorry, uh, well, it's a peptide bond, but it's also an amide bond, right? So a peptide bond is always also known as an amide bond, right? Amide bond. 
Again, linking two or more amino acids together by a peptide slash amide bond is, uh, makes a peptide. And you can imagine how long these things can get, right? Gazillion amino acids together, right? Um, so I've been talking about peptides a lot in the last few slides. I've never actually told you what they are. What are peptides? Well, peptides are basically amide bonds, right? What is an amide bond? It's that bond that's between the carbon and the nitrogen of an amide group, uh, the amide functional group, right? So peptide bonds are amide bonds, right? They're formed between the carboxylate of one amino acid and the amine of the other amino acid, the next one down, right? The next one to it. And like I was saying before already, linking two of those or more amino acids by a peptide bond forms a peptide, okay? So a peptide is basically a series of amino acids that are linked together, one of the many of the 20 all linked together, right, by an amide bond, and you make a peptide. So I will use probably amide and peptides uh, interchangeably, so just know that they're, they're the same type of bond. So looking over at this example over here, we've got a glycine over here, all right, this side is glycine, and then over here we have an alanine. We know it's an alanine because there's the methyl group of the R group right there, right? And then there's the, over here we know the gly, it's a glycine because there's the hydrogen of the R group right there, right? And then they're bonded together, forming what we call a dipeptide. A dipeptide, right? Using a amide bond right there or a peptide bond, right? And this entire group right here, of course, is an amide functional group. So when you form a peptide bond, the two amino acids on either side of the uh, amide functional group, right, are bonded together by the peptide bond, right? And then the thing that you need to glean, oh my God, that's like the fifth time I've used the word glean today. Uh, you can glean from this that uh, once you get more amino acids attaching to it, right, with the peptide bonds, and it becomes a peptide, that sequence of amino acids is known as the primary structure of a protein, all right? It's known as the primary structure of a protein. We'll go through the different types of structures of proteins, but the first one you need to know is the primary structure. And that is quite literally the peptide bond or the peptide, right? Which is the amino acids that are in that sequence, right? That are attached to each other by a peptide bond, right? That's the, the most basic structure of a protein, the primary structure. And uh, this is just an easier way of seeing it. We have a expanded, um, excuse me, structural formula right here. There's the peptide bond, right? Also known as an amide bond right there. That is between the glycine over here and the um, alanine on that side. And then as, as, as I mentioned earlier, the side with the amino group is called the N-terminus <clears throat> or the N-terminal N, excuse me. And the side with the carboxylate is the C-terminus or the C-terminal side. Um, I've heard people use it either way. Terminus, terminal, you know, all means it's the end, right? So let's keep on trucking along here. All right, let's do some peptide practice. So the question says to draw a dipeptide of serine and theranine, right? Um, remember that serine, serine, <laughs> remember that serine is the one with the R group that had the CH2, right, OH, right, that's its R group. And then theranine was almost exactly the same thing, CH2, actually it's CH, OH, right, except it had an extra methyl group at the end. Right? So that's serine and that's therine. Therine. And so when I do this, I always draw out the R group so I can remember what they look like because even I forget them sometimes. And I'm supposedly a, a, a formally trained biochemist. Anyway, <laughs> and then once I get that straight and I know what the R groups are, I draw the backbones first. 
And so I start out by drawing the mean group in H3+, plus, right? And then the alpha carbon down to the carboxylate. And then up to the next amine group, right? To the alpha carbon. And then back to the carboxylate, right? And so remember that this part right here, right there, that's the peptide bond. Right? That's the peptide bond. This guy, this side right here is the C terminus. And this side right here is the N terminus. Right? And I've drawn everything there except for the hydrogens and the R groups on the uh, alpha carbons. Right? So since the amino groups and the carboxylate is pointing downwards on the serine, I'll draw the hydrogen up there like that and the R group CH2OH up there like that, right? And then similarly here, since the amine is pointing upwards this time and so is the carboxylate, I'll make the hydrogen pointing down with three anines R group coming down. And that's how you draw the dipeptide serine theranine, right? The serine theranine. The important part is just to remember, right, that this part right here is the peptide bond. That's how you join two amino acids together. And if you look at it closely, it just looks like an amide bond. So an amide bond is basically, a peptide bond is a amide bond that's inside of a peptide, right? They're the same thing. Let's keep on moving. So I alluded to this before, right? Um, the primary structure of proteins is actually the amino acid, right? Sequence, right? It's the amino acids. So when you look at this one, for example, we start out with alanine, glycine, and serine, right? Put it all together and you get alenoglycylserine, which is its name, the name of the peptide, right? And the primary structure is literally the sequence of alanine, glycine, and serine together, right? Here's another amino acid sequence that's also known as the primary structure, right? The primary structure of this peptide is alanine, right? So we know that because of the, the methyl group right there. Leucine, we know that because of this alkyl group right here. Then cysteine, SH right there with the CH2. And then methionine, right? That's how we know. So when we say primary structure, just remember that the primary structure of a protein is the actual here it says particular sequence of amino acids that are held together by the peptide bonds and of course if we're talking about primary structures they're going to be secondaries tertiaries and quaternaries but we'll get to that in a sec so in a previous slide if you recall i was talking about how proteins can function as um, um hormones right hormones are things that, that trigger certain biological functions right and the peptide of sequence with primary sequence glutamate, histidine, and proline is actually a thyroid hormone, right? And that thyroid hormone releases, activates or stimulates the release of thyroxin, right? Uh, in your body. A more interesting one is insulin. Insulin is also a peptide hormone, right? It's got two chains in it, an A chain and a B chain, right? And the A chain has 21 amino acids in it, and the B chain has 30 amino acids in it, right? And you can see here that they're being held together by these things here, 
and I was telling you about these before because my boss's boss was the one that used dithyl 3 tol to reduce those. But these are the disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds, right? They're the covalent interaction that holds proteins uh, together, or in this case, primary structures together, right? And you notice here there's a, a sequence of amino acids that are going through from the N terminal to the C terminal, right, on both chain A and chain B. And it's those, it's that sequence of amino acids that makes insulin do what it does, right? Because there are receptors on your liver cells and on your muscles and uh, that, will, uh, that will accept the insulin, right, and trigger the storage of glucose uh, as glycogen, right? which I think we talked about a little bit in the uh, sugar lecture, right? So peptoids, peptides are very important, right? And the important thing about these particular peptides is that they are a sequence of amino acids that are primary structure, but they don't go into secondary or tertiary or quaternary structures to be functional, right? We'll talk about those, those in a second. Moving along, we have some more uh, important uh, peptides. We have oxytocin here. It stimulates the uterine contractions in labor, right? It's got this amino acid sequence right here, right? Cysteine, theranine, phenylalanine, isoleucine. Sorry. Oxytocin has isoleucine. Vasopressin has phenylalanine there, right? Glutamine, asparagine, cysteine, proline. Same thing here, oxytocin has leucine there, and uh, vasopressin has arginine there, and glycine. And they're being, uh, this primary structure is being held together covalently with another disulfide bond, right? Another disulfide bond. So interestingly enough though, Just a change in amino acids at one position, or in this case, two positions, right, turns oxytocin into vasopressin, right? Vas vas uh, vasopressin, the antidiuretic hormone that regulates blood pressure, right? So you can see how just changing single amino acids, two or three amino acids, or even deleting an amino acid or, or adding an amino acid can change the function of... Uh, of proteins and enzymes, right? Some leading to disease. Some leading to disease, right? Here's the uh, here's the amino acid or primary sequence of beta endorphin, right? All these like well-known like hormones and drugs and such. Many of them are are uh, or peptide uh, sequences or are. are our short, our short peptides, primary sequences, right? Moving on. Oh, more peptide practice. How exciting. Okay. Um, amino acid. What amino acid is at the N-terminus? Well, the amino acid at the N-terminus is this guy right here, right? What is that one? Anybody remember? I'm giving you five guesses. Did you guys guess? I don't know if you did or not, but I'll go ahead and tell you. The N-terminal amino acid is... Phenylalanine, right? You can you know that because remember, an alanine has just the CH three there, or methyl group there, and then you add it on a phenyl group, right? So that's phenylalanine. Phenylalanine. What is the what is the amino acid at the C terminus, right? Well, that's this guy right here. That's that guy right there. And what's up there? Dang, I already gave it away in the last one. When well, it's just a methyl group, what is that? That's just an alanine. So what's the name of this tripeptide? Well, phenyl, alanine, and this is what? Anybody know what the middle one is? It's the one that my old boss is boss, you know, that whole thing I keep on telling you guys about. Yeah, cysteine. I always spell it wrong. I think it's like that. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I before E, except after C. Yeah. So phenylalanyl cystinyl alanyl. I forgot to add in the nails at the end. So let's try that again. Phenyl alanyl alanyl, all right? Cystinyl. Alanine. I don't think I'll ever ask you to do that, but just be able to identify these amino acids, right? Phenyl, alanyl, cystineal, alanine. That's the name of that di di tri that tripeptide, right? <laughs> Moving forward, ah, after we have a primary structure, we have this thing called a secondary structure. There are multiple secondary structures. One of the most common, though, is called the alpha helix. Very much like the double helix of, uh, of uh, DNA, except this is only a single helix, right? We'll call it an alpha helix. Okay. And the way it forms is that a hydrogen bond forms between the, car the carbonyl of the, car of the uh, carbonyl group, right? And the, uh, uh, the hydrogen, the oxygen of the carbonyl group and the hydrogen of the amine group, right? of the amide bonds in the next turn of the alpha helix, right? So literally, what's happening here is that we have an amino acid, right, that's right here on the N-terminal end, and it's bending around, and it has a hydrogen right there, right? And that hydrogen bond, that hydrogen is bonding with the oxygen from the carbonyl of the next peptide bond, right? Um, it's interesting because this goes all the way up the chain. You can see it here. There's one there, right, that I just pointed out to you. There's one there. There's one there. This one there, and one there, and one there, and one there, right? And the interesting thing about it is that... Um, this happens throughout the entire peptide chain, and uh, if it's a certain type of amino acid, right, that allows for very close quarters like that, right, where its steric hindrance is minimal enough that it can get close enough to do that hydrogen bonding, you'll get the amino acid, uh, the, the amino acid chain or the peptide chain to spiral, right, spiral around like an alpha helix, right. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. So that's the alpha helix. Right? That's the alpha helix. If we keep on going, another secondary structure is known as the beta pleated sheet. Right? And on the beta pleated sheet, same kind of thing going on here, where we have hydrogen bonds occurring between the... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, hydrogen of the amide and the uh, oxygen of the carbonyl of the of amino acids, right? And if the R groups are small enough, and in this case, you know, if they're, for example, methyls or just hydrogens, they can get even closer to each other. And when they get this close to each other, right? When they get this close to each other, you can form a beta pleated sheet. And it really looks like just like a, a sheet of paper that's kind of ruffled, right? It looks like a sheet of paper that's kind of ruffled, three-dimensionally, which is pretty neat. Pretty neat. All right, moving on. <clears throat> Another one known as a triple helix is basically like an alpha helix with three of them wrapped to, with each other, right? Three peptide, peptide chains wrapped to, with each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so those are typical in things like collagen, connective tissue, skin, tendons, and cartilage, right? Collagen fibers are triple helices of the of peptide chains held together by hydrogen bonds, which you already know that because alpha helices are held together by hydrogen bonds too. So in this case, not only do you have the hydrogen bonds holding the 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 chain, the single chain together to make the spiral like just within the chain, but then with the other two chains, there are hydrogen bonding occurring too, that holding those together too. And you've got to have some really small like R groups 
to be able to overcome the Stark hindrance to make uh, a, a a triple helix that, is, that that's woven that tightly together, right? But all these, <coughs> excuse me, all these structures, these alpha helices, the beta sheets, beta pleated sheets, the the triple helix, they're all being held together by hydrogen bonding. Just remember that. Right. That's what I want you to remember from that. So, it turns out that there are a lot of diseases that have to do with the uh, with the uh, secondary structures. And one that is very prevalent is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease. I've never been able to say that right. Um uh, signs of dementia, uh, increasing memory loss, inability to handle daily operations. Those are the the, the things you look out for when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, right? And what's actually happening here with Alzheimer's, which there's not a cure to yet, right? But in a person's brain with Alzheimer's, the beta amyloid proteins change shape from a normal alpha helis to, that are soluble to sticky beta pleated sheets, right? So here's what it's supposed to be inside the brain that are soluble. And then they turn these into these sticky beta sheet beta pleated sheets, right? And the problem with that is that beta, these beta pleated sheets are the fragments that become the plaques that are uh, that are uh, uh, prevalent in the neurons, right, of an Alzheimer's brain, right? The diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is based on the presence of plaque and neural uh, neural. Uh, neuron by bright to uh, how do you say? Oh, neurofibrillial neurofibrillary tangles <laughs> that's a hard word for me for some reason in the neurons that affect the transmission of nerve cells, right? So, when you have the those beta pleated sheets that are not supposed that are not soluble, right? And you have the neurofibrillary tangles. They inhibit the transmission of of nerve signals, and so that's uh, 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 the uh, that's what uh, Alzheimer's is about, right? Sadly, there's not a cure for this for Alzheimer's disease, but if you're ever wondering, that's how Alzheimer's happens, right? These alpha sh alpha helices that are normally um, water soluble, right? They become these alpha pleated, these beta pleated sheets that are insoluble and sticky, right? Next comes the tertiary structures, and these are what we all, as biochemists, when we say protein or an enzyme, right, we uh, we think of them in these types of structures, tertiary structures, right? So, in a tertiary structure, it's the actual three-dimensional structure of a protein that includes the beta-pleated sheets and the alpha helices, right? And everything that's being held together with the covalent bond, the disulfide bond, right? But in a tertiary structure, the protein is being held together by the non-covalent interactions inside the protein, right? Non-covalent interactions between the different side chains of the, or R groups of the amino acids. Not the covalent interaction, right? The covalent interaction was the disulfide bond I was talking about before. So these non covalent interactions, right, or the hydrophobic interactions, right, between two nonpolar amino acids, right, um, hydrophilic interactions between two, the external aqueous environment and the R groups of the polar amino acids. We have salt bridges, which are ionic bonds between the ionized groups of basic and acidic amino acids. And then we have the hydrogen bonding, which you, we talked about before, uh, between the uh, uh, the amino acids that form alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, right? And I already spoke about this before, the disulfide bonds, which are the one covalent interaction that holds three-dimensional structures of protein together. So let's first talk about the hydrophobic interactions. It's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's, it's the interactions between nonpolar molecules uh, because they're afraid of water. That's what hydrophobic comes from, right? And they tend to want to be together. Those hydrophobic molecules want to be want to be together, right? So they can minimize their energy and keep the water on the outside, right? So that's what a hydrophobic interaction is. 
Obviously, hydrophobic interactions occur with the nonpolar amino acids. Things like phenylalanine or uh, um, glycine, uh, alanine, those kinds of things, right? So let me see if I can find a hydrophilic interaction somewhere here. Let me hydrophobic interaction right here. Right here, there's a hydrophobic interaction right there between two phenylalanine groups, right? <clears throat> I notice, right, here's another hydrophobic interaction over here, two alanines, right? And it's keeping, it's actively keeping the water molecules outside of that area, right? Making the area where it's all combined or, or all close to each other hydrophobic, right? So as far as hydrophobic interactions go, we have here the um, tyrosine and serine, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I said hydrophobic. I meant hydrophilic. The hydrophilic interactions go. Um, we have the tyrosine and uh, tyrosine and serine here, right? And they both have OH groups, right? Very similar to water having its H2O, and that's why it's a hydrophilic interaction, right? And so it's perfectly happy being outside. Uh, being exposed to this environment of water, right? There's all water out here, right? Right? All water outside. Then we have salt bridges, right? Again, uh, so some examples. Here's a salt bridge right here between the carboxylate of that amino acid and the amine group of that amino acid. That's a salt bridge, too. Salt bridges are also, uh, they like water, so that's not, it's not a big deal there, but... Uh, but those are the salt bridges. You know they're salt bridges because they have charges right there. Plus sign, minus sign, right? Um, are there any other salt bridges? I think that was the only one. And then we have hydrogen bonding. There's hydrogen bonding all all throughout <laughs> this molecule, right? There's a bunch of hydrogen bonds happening in there, uh, in the uh, in the uh, alpha helix there. There's a bunch of hydrogen bonding happening there and the beta pleated sheet there. All these alpha helices have hydrogen bonding. But it does point out one specific hydrogen bond right here between the uh, these two serines right here, right? These two serines of two separate helices, right? Two separate helices. That's hydrogen bonding. And then last but not least, a little example of disulfide bonds right here, right? And they're holding, they're holding to, together covalently, right? That's why you see that when you look at a disulfide bond, it's a solid line between the two S's. But when you look at things like hydrogen bonding, there's just three dots, right? Or hydrophobic interaction. It doesn't look like there's a dots or lines at all. Hydrophobic or and hydrophilic, right? Because well, those are all non-covalent. Same thing with the salt bridge, right? Um, I accidentally marked out the plus sign that was on that nitrogen right there, but it's a nitrogen plus ammonium group right there. Right, uh, but yeah, those are the the, the, the examples of the the four non-covalent interactions. Right, I like to call these the four non-covalent interactions. Non-covalent interactions, and then the one covalent interaction. Covalent interaction that holds the tertiary structure of proteins and amino acids together right moving forward we have the quaternary structure right uh, this should look very familiar to you this is the exact same uh, uh, example I gave you on the very first day of class about hemoglobin um, the quaternary structure of a protein is oh that's really weird there's a font problem right there. That should be a bigger font. Not like a, a material problem, right? But a font problem. Anyway, so coordinate structures are basically a bunch of tertiary structures being held together, right? Uh, and so if you look at, for example, uh, the hemoglobin here. I forgot to say that. Hemoglobin. I always forget if hemoglobin has an A or not. It doesn't have an A. Hemoglobin, right? That's hemoglobin. And if you look at hemoglobin, it looks like it's made up of multiple tertiary structures, right? Multiple. Um, the red, the two red chains are alpha chains, right? Which are this guy and this guy. 
All right. And then the two. Huh. Interesting. That's a typo. Oh, I got a little confused here because it said two, two, uh, two blue are the beta chains. <laughs> Uh, where are the beta chains at? Because this is orange. <laughs> Maybe I used the wrong picture. Anyway, four subunits, right? Four subunits. And the one thing that is correct here is the heme group. And there's a heme group right there, and it's in green, right? Multiple heme groups. But the point of this particular picture is that hemoglobin is made up of four. Uh, two plus two right four um, subunits right and there are uh, and they all bind all four of them bind oxygen right there's a heme glare that binds oxygen there's a heme group there that binds oxygen there's a heme group there that binds oxygen and there's a heme group there that binds oxygen yeah so yeah that's very confusing. I, I feel like the, this is the wrong picture, but it doesn't matter because two of them are <clears throat> two of one color are the alpha uh, subunit, and two of the other color are the beta subunits or beta chains, right? And and uh, whoever me <laughs> wrote that there as blue and red, I'm obviously colorblind. No, I'm not color colorblind. That was just a, a typo, I guess. Anyway, moving forward, but that's a quaternary structure. So, just as a quick review, and this is the part I really want you to know, the primary structure, right, goes to the secondary structure, goes to the tertiary structure, goes to the quaternary structure, right? Yeah, see, I have the same picture here again, so I must have just picked the wrong colors <laughs> on the last slide. Anyway, yes, that's the order. Primary, <clears throat> excuse me, which is the... Uh, the uh, amino acid sequence, right? Remember that. Amino acid sequence is the primary structure. And then the secondary structure right here is the alpha helis. Uh, let me make an alpha, like a true Greek person there. There, there we go. The alpha helis, which could actually be a beta pleated sheet too, right? These form with hydrogen bonding. Right, and then from there, the secondary structure can become a tertiary structure when a whole bunch of them get together and form the four non-covalent interactions to hold together. Right, and the one covalent interaction. What were those four again? Hydrophobic interactions, hydrophilic, right. Then salt bridges. Or we can also call those ionic interactions. And then last but not least, in the non-covalent hydrogen bonding. And then the one covalent interaction is what? The disulfide bond. There we go. So, sorry that took a second there. My finger accidentally went onto the Siri button. And Siri kept on coming up. <laughs> anyway, keep going. The show must move forward. Next. So, just a quick summary of everything, which I just did a second ago, which tells you how important this stuff is, right? At the primary uh, level of protein structure we have the amino acids that join becoming a specific polypeptide sequence right at the secondary structure level we have the alpha helices and the beta sheets that are formed by hydrogen bonding between the atoms of the peptide backbone at the tertiary we have uh, the three-dimensional structure of the polypeptides as they fold into compact three-dimensional shapes 
that are stabilized by the non-covalent -inter non interactions like the hydrogen bonds, salt bridges, hydrophobic interactions, and the hydrophilic interactions, and the covalent bond interaction, which is the disulfide bond, right? This, oh, this is important. I didn't even say this before. This is what forms the biologically active protein. That's important. Okay. And the quaternary structures are basically more two or more protein units, right, that are tertiary structures that are stabilized. They combine together and stabilize with the same non-covalent and covalent interactions and become an active biological protein, right? <clears throat> so over here to the right, I actually have some interesting stuff. When I was in grad school, um, I studied two different enzymes. I already told you about one before. The first one was luciferase, and that's this guy right here. This is luciferase. Uh, so what luciferase does is that it's an enzyme that catalyzes a reaction with the substrate luciferin, and it will, um, uh, in this reaction, uh, uh, produce blue light, right? And I thought, oh man, that's really cool. I'm gonna study that, figure out how that's work, how that works, right? So this is actually luciferin here, and you can see in luciferin, it actually has a beta pleated sheet right here, right? But its interactions are such, they're so interesting that the beta pleated sheet will wraps around itself, right, making a beta, what we call a beta barrel, right? So the sheet folds around, it becomes a cylinder, and we call that a beta barrel. The other interesting thing, too, is all the alpha helices you see. But specifically, these three alpha helices up here, with those H's there, the H stands for histidine, and the number is the number in the sequence of where the histidine is located in the primary structure, right? That alpha helis actually, those alpha helices act like a little lid to the beta barrel, right? So the, here's the barrel, right? And there's a three, here's the three alpha helices, right? And based on pH, those uh, alpha helices slash those histidines, those three that are on the picture right there, right, will either open or close the beta barrel. And if the beta barrel is open, luciferin, the substrate, can go inside the beta barrel, right? And when it goes inside the beta barrel, uh, the uh, luciferase will act on it and produce blue light, right? But if the beta barrel is closed, then luciferin can't go in and it won't make any blue light, right? And it's all based on pH. It's actually really cool. Um, then up here, we have an enzyme called MCR. Uh, notice that it has multiple subunits. Oh, you know what? That's probably where I got the blue from. I was probably looking at that, like blue versus red. Anyway, um, we all make mistakes, right? <laughs> so it has multiple subunits, the, and this is called MCR. MCR is short for methylcoenzyme M reductase, right? And what methylcoenzyme M reductase does is that it can change things like CO2 into methane, right? Which is awesome because methane is a fuel and CO2 is a greenhouse gas, right? Uh, in a process called methanogenesis. Methanogenesis. So another protein disease um, is sickle cell anemia, right? Uh, and in sickle cell anemia, we have hemoglobin. And hemoglobin in the red blood cell, right, has the normal, uh, uh, has a beta chain in it that has the normal sequence, valine, histidine, leucine, threonine, proline, glutamate, glutamate, and lysine, right? But in a patient that has sickle cell anemia, that beta chain has this glutamate switched out, the sixth one right here, switched out with a valine, right? It's switched out with a valine. That causes all kinds of problems. First of all, the glutamate is a polar amino acid, a polar amino acid, right? And the valine that I got switched out for is a non-polar amino acid. And I remember what I said before, like there's all kinds of diseases can, can come about just from the addition of an amino acid, the subtraction of an amino acid, or the change, substitution of an amino acid. And here, the change is a glutamate to a valine. Bad problems happen then, because that turns the hemoglobin in the red blood cell into a really weird shape, right? Mostly because since you have a nonpolar amino acid now, right, instead of a polar amino acid, those nonpolar amino acids will do hydrophobic interactions with other parts of the hemoglobin that were not supposed to be there to begin with, right? Um, 
And so it turns it into this weird shape. And what that does is that it diminishes the ability of the hemoglobin to transport oxygen, right? But to boot, those hydrophobic interactions cause things like clogs and arteries and inflammation and pain and organ damage because they, since they're doing the the, the hydrophobic interactions, they tend to clump up. And if you remember what I was saying before about hydrophobic interactions, they tend to clump up with each other, right, so that they can all be together and they can have the water on the outside of them, right? And when they clump up together, they can do all, they can be all kinds of, they can be really sticky and they can uh, uh, clog up arteries and, and cause blood clots and stuff, right? So, and capillaries. So sickle cell is not a fun thing to have. Not, not a fun thing to have at all. Interestingly, though, the first time I was actually interest, introduced to sickle cell anemia was in the context of parasitology. And we were studying the parasite plasmodium, which causes malaria. And it turns out that patients with, with sickle cell anemia were less likely to uh, be uh, infected uh, by malaria and the plasmodium parasite because the plasmodium parasite couldn't uh, extract enough nutrients from the sickle cell of the patients of sickle cell anemia, right? So I guess it's a trade-off. Do you want to have sickle cell anemia or do you want to have malaria? I wouldn't want to have either, honestly, right? But that's sickle cell anemia. Moving forward. Oh, denaturization of proteins, right? So um, in biochemistry, we do a lot of denaturing proteins because oftentimes, you know, uh, uh, we need to study them by figuring out what their size are, their properties are, and we have to do a bunch of different things to make make them so that they come out to their primary structures, break apart from their their tertiary structures and come out to the primary structures, right? And the main way of doing that is with heat, right? Uh, because a lot of the a lot of the uh, non 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 covalent interactions I was talking about was hydrogen bonding, right? And so if you think about it. Hydrogen bonding is the same thing that keeps the water together, right? And when you boil the water up to 100 degrees Celsius, right, uh, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, what you're doing is you're actually introducing enough energy into that water that it overcomes the energy in the hydrogen bonds and allows for the water to evaporate, right? In a sense, you're denaturing the water. Not really. You're not denaturing the water. You're just making it uh, making it possible for the water to evaporate by disrupting those hydrogen bonds. Well, it's a similar thing with proteins. You can use heat to break apart the hydrogen bonds, right, and disrupt the hydrophobic interactions in proteins, right, to denature them, to make them flatten out into their substituent structures, right. Acids and bases can also do that too, right. Uh, those will break the hydrogen bonds between the R groups and ionic and ionic uh, bonds as well. Their salt bridges. Heavy metals can also interact with the disulfide bonds, uh, right? And then agitation, like physical agitation, actually like physically messing with them, right? Will, shrug, will stretch the peptide bonds until they break, right? And so a really good inter good example of denaturing proteins is eggs, right? Which I'm not really sure. Oh, yeah, okay. For some reason, I thought that was a lunch pail, but that's really just a gas stove in a frying pan. <laughs> like, why does that person have fried eggs just in their lunch bag with nothing around it? That doesn't make any sense. Why did I pick this picture? Anyway, the egg whites of a protein, right, are denatured when you heat them up, right, when you eat them, right? Uh, and the active protein, you know, the egg white looks like that. And then you add in some some heat and then you stir it around a little bit and then you add in some salt just all the stuff that you add here right like i was talking about in these little bullet points and then you get a denature protein which is a cooked egg white which actually tastes really good and healthy for you right so you you literally disrupted the tertiary structure of the egg white right by cooking it in a frying pan and not just having it inside of your lunch pail uh with nothing at all <laughs> i'm losing it today so there's a little summary of uh, denaturing processes that you can use to disrupt proteins, right? Heating it above 50 degrees can disrupt the hydrogen bonds, the hydrophobic interactions between the non-R groups, right? Non-polar R groups. Examples of that is cooking food and autoclaving surgical items. That's how you kill the bacteria, right? On, uh, on uh, like scalpels and, you know, hemostats and such. Um, interestingly, though, this is above 150 degrees Celsius right there, right? But when you're autoclaving, 
you're actually autoclaving up to 121 degrees Celsius. That's a lot. Uh, what? There it goes. I don't know why I put a zero at the end of that. 121 degrees Celsius. So that's super hot, right? So acid is a basis. Of course, they disrupt the hydrogen bonds because almost anything can. But then it also disrupts the hydrogen bonds between the salt bridges. Uh, the bonds between the salt bridges, right? That's like, that's like using lactic acid from bacteria, which can denature milk proteins, right? That's why your milk goes bad, right? And the preparation of yogurt and cheese. Organic compounds can also denature proteins. Of course, they disrupt the hydrophobic interactions, adding things like ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, right, to disinfect wounds and prepare for skin injections. That kills bacteria that way, right? Like when I had to uh, do that with my, uh, my hand there because my dog bite and I had stitches. Uh, that hurt a lot. Lots of pro lots of prostaglandins being produced there, by the way. Heavy metals, right? Like uh, uh, heavy metals like silver, lead, and mercury, right? They they actually uh, interrupted the sulfide bonds, right? By for by forming uh, ionic bonds, right? They do these like little metal complexes with them, and they th that's how it helps that, right? That's and examples of that would be like mercury and lead poisoning. And then physical agitation. That disrupts the hydrophobic bonds, hydro, hydrogen bonds by stretching the polypeptide chains until they break, right? Like whipping ice cream or making meringue from egg whites. It's, it's all the same, right? Ah, baking. You know, I started watching a show on Netflix. It's awesome. The Great British Baking Show. God, it's a good show. You should watch that. There's a lot of egg white whipping in there. Which means there's a lot of physical agitation of proteins in there. Which means you should watch it because it's about your class. So what are enzymes? Well, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Enzymes are biological catalysts. Whoops. Let's go back. And I forgot to turn on the drawing thing. Let me do that real quick. You have to do all kinds of stuff just to get it so you can draw on your stuff. Here we go. Again, enzymes are biological catalysts. Right? Remember what happens... Uh, with regular catalysts, uh, like uh, when we're talking about organic chemistry and hydrocarbon chemistry and all that stuff, where we would use some kind of metal, right, to lower the activation energy required to get over this hump for a reaction to proceed, right? All biological catalysts are the exact same thing. They allow for the uh, lowering of the activation energy, right, so that a uh, reaction that would otherwise not be uh, spontaneous, right? Like something that you really need to have happen in your body, right? For you to be alive, right? A biological catalyst, the enzymes, make it possible for those to happen. So uh, in this particular reaction I have here, in this example, right? This is actually uh, carbon dioxide becoming water, becoming HC3, uh, H, uh, bicarbonate, and uh, uh, some protons, right? And this reaction is indicative of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, okay? And carbonic anhydrase makes it easier for you to go back and forth between CO2 and water and HC3O minus and H plus. And it's actually a very important part of your body. This is a part of the carbonate bicarbonate buffering system. Carbonate bicarbonate. buffering system in your blood, right? And it's what maintains the correct pH and homeostasis in the blood in your body, right? Without carbonic anhydrase, the enzyme, <laughs> let's just say you wouldn't be surviving any kind of crazy uh, uh, pH shifts uh, in your blood, right? So that's what carbon carbonic anhydrase does. So remember, what are enzymes? They're biological catalysts. And what they do is that they lower the activation energy, right? So that reactions that otherwise would not be very easy to do become easier to do so that uh, biological uh, functions can proceed, right? Seamlessly, right? Proceed seamlessly. So that's the important thing there, right? So there are a few different types of enzymes. Um, and uh, actually, let's talk about their naming first. As I was saying before, an enzyme always ends in ACE, right? Literally, the uh, uh, 
enzymes name it will be the name of the substrate that it acts on with the word a with the ace at the end for example sucrase is an enzyme that acts on sucrose right oh yes so easy right um so an oxidase is an enzyme that catalyzes a oxidation reaction right and they, I mean, uh, and uh, of course there are like many different types of, uh, of enzymes. Like I was saying before, they're, they're, these are all enzyme classifications, right? And so the oxidoreductases are the enzymes that do oxidation reduction reactions. Transferases, what do they do? They transfer groups of atoms back and forth between uh, different substrates. Hydrolases, what do they do? They use water to break bonds, right? Hydrolysis, right? Hydro meaning water, lysis meaning to break something, right? Lyases, right? And this is an enzyme that adds or removes atoms for, uh, to or from a double bond. Isomerases, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? It rearranges atoms, but specifically it rearranges atoms so that the substrate is still a uh, uh, an isomer of the the product is still the an isomer of the substrate right so structurally the 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 substrate will be different from the the product but after the enzyme works on it but the formulas will still be the same isomers and then ligases i'm a big fan of ligases we use a lot of ligases to uh splice dna molecules together and they, those use a, uh, ATP, right, to combine small molecules together. But in my case, I used ligases to combine long molecules of DNA together, right? So those are the, the classes of enzymes. All right, so where the magic happens, right? Um, I don't know why I put a question mark there. That should be like a where the magic happens, dot, dot, dot. It's not really a question. This is, a, this is where the magic happens. The magic happens in this thing called the active site, right, of the enzyme. What exactly is the active site? It's the region on the enzyme, right, that has a shape that fits the reacting molecule, right? And that molecule is called the substrate, the thing I keep on referring to before. What is the substrate? It's the molecule that the enzyme reacts with or acts on, right, to do something. Inside the active site, there are amino acid groups, R groups, that bind to the substrate, right? And some of them actually uh, do chemistry with the substrate. And when the enzyme is completed with the reaction, it releases the products, right? The substrate is now changed into the products, right? So you can see here, we have an enzyme. This is the enzyme part right here, the big bob, uh, bobular, right, thing. And there's the active site. And the substrate is coming into the active site right there, okay? Taking a close look at the active site, yes, this shape kind of does match the shape of the substrate or the molecule that's being acted upon, right? But, like I was saying before, you know, uh, serine is actually very important in active sites, right? Here it is doing hydrogen bonding with another serine that's in the substrate, right? There's a hydrophobic pocket right here in the active site, which means that it's a pocket, like a little hole, that has only hydrophobic, uh, sorry, only nonpolar amino acids like valine, alanine, leucine, and valine again. And since that's there... The substrate has a phenyl ring right there, or benzene, no sticking off of it, that loves to just seat itself right in that little pocket, right? So it sits there, right? And then here we have a lysine, and the lysine is doing an ionic uh, interaction or a salt bridge with the with the carboxylate that's coming off of the uh, coming off of the substrate. So I'm not sure what this example is, but it's just an example of a substrate inside of an enzyme. Once the reaction is done. I guess what it does is it makes it so it pops, it separates, it pops out, and the reaction is complete. And then the enzyme, since it's a catalyst, it's not actually used up in the reaction, and you can actually use it again, right? You can actually use it again. It can do as many reactions as it wants uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the active site once the substrate leaves. So we can describe uh, the enzyme catalyzed reaction as such, right? A substrate attaches to the active site 
then the enzyme substrate complex forms, and then the reaction occurs, and then the products are released, and the enzyme is used over and over and over again. So as biochemists, we like to use these little initials here because we're simple, like I said. We have the enzyme, and we have the substrate, right? We add them together, and we get the enzyme substrate complex, and when the reaction is done, we get the enzyme again back into its original, uh, uh, back into its original form, and we get our product, right? So a, a good example of this, right, would be uh, the uh, an enzyme that actually hydrolyzes the disaccharide lactose, right? It actually breaks that one four glycosidic bond uh, that uh, that lactose has, right? Lactose has lactose. So the enzyme is named lactase, and so that's the E for the enzyme. And then lactose, right, is the substrate. That's a sub. That's a substrate. The enzyme substrate complex is the lactase lactose complex. And once the enzyme is complete with the reaction, right, you get lactase back out again as the original enzyme, and then you get two glucoses, or sorry, a glucose and a galactose. Right? Because lactase, lactase, the enzyme, breaks, excuse me, breaks lactose, ah, excuse me, lactase, the enzyme, breaks lactose into its substituent sugars, which is glucose and galactose, galactose, right? So that's in that example. There are a couple of different uh, enzyme action models, right? And a very old model is known as the lock and key model. And it's, it sounds exactly like it sounds. It is exactly what it sounds like, right? Where the substrate has a certain shape, right? And then the enzyme's active site has a shape that's the exact opposite of that shape. And it fits in perfectly like a key and lock, right? Forming the enzyme substrate complex, right? Um, those that A, B, and C there represents different pockets of different amino acids and such uh, uh, side chains or R groups that will uh, bind to uh, uh, their counterparts over in the substrate, right? But we know now though that the uh, we know now though that the that enzymes and proteins and their amino acids are actually very fluid and flexible, right? And so this lock and key model isn't quite so a more realistic model is known as the induced fit model, right? Uh, in the induced fit model, we have the enzyme's active site looking like a different shape than the substrate, right? But as the substrate approaches, it will induce the enzyme through different interactions, the different uh, non-covalent interactions, right? It will induce, uh, using its non-covalent interactions, induce a shape that will fit the substrate. And this particular model is way, uh, is way more accepted, right? So using, using, um, using lactose as an example again, right? We have the enzyme lactase here, right? With its active sites that are triangular shaped or valley shaped like that. But when the substrate glucose comes, uh, sorry, lactose comes in, right? These are hexagonal shaped. In certain interactions, uh, the non-covalent interactions, right, as they get closer, will induce a shape that will fit the substrate perfectly, right, whereas before it didn't fit perfectly. And when that happens, the enzyme substrate complex carries out the reaction and it separates, right, it hydrolyzes or separates uh, uh, lactose into its substituent saccharides, right, glucose and galactose, right? So that's what the induced fit model is, right? So that's important. Before we had the lock and key model, where the substrate is opposite the side, the, the substrate shape is opposite the shape that's inside the enzyme and it fits perfectly, right? There's no movement there. But in the induced fit model, the substrate will come closer to the enzyme, right? basically activating it and once it does that through like different non-covalent interactions that we spoke about before right because they're flexible then we'll induce a fit of the 
the, 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 the disaccharide and then proceed with the reaction, right? And again, this is the more accepted form, uh, the more accepted uh, model when it comes to enzyme action. So there are also things called isozymes. One is known as lactate dehydrogenase, right? And what lactate dehydrogenase does is that it, uh, it, actually, it actually oxidizes lactate into pyruvate, right? Giving you an NADH, right? Which is just an electron carrier in the metabolic chain. Um, in the metabolic in, in a metabolic pathway, right? And so there are five different isozymes of lactate dehydrogenase, right? There are five of them. And it, each one of them contain a mix of polypeptide units of M and H, right? So the units are M and H. Kind of like when we were talking about uh, um, hemoglobin before, it was alpha units and beta units. Well, in... Um, in a uh, 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 ice in the uh, lactate dehydrogenase, it's M and H subunits, right? And they're used to convert lactate to pyruvate in different organs, which I already spoke about. In the liver and the muscle, lactate is converted to pyruvate by LDH five, right? Which is isozyme five. The isozyme with four M subunits, right? In the heart, the same reaction is catalyzed by LDH two. Right, and this one contain, contains four H subunits. Right, so the difference between LDH one, right, or lactate dehydrogenase one, and LDH five, lactate dehydrogenase five, is f lactate dehydrogenase lactate dehydrogenase five has four M subunits, whereas its isozyme LDH or lactate dehydrogenase 1 has four H subunits. And we'll take a closer look at that in just a second here. So here we can see the different LDHs, right? Here's LDH 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, right? Sorry, my head's covering that one right there, but this is LDH 5. Right, that's LDH 5 right there. And remember what we said, LDH5 has four M subunits, right? And LDH1 has four H subunits. LDH4 is in the heart and kidneys. LDH2 is in the red blood cells, heart, kidneys, and brain. LDH3, which has two H subunits and two M subunits, is in the brain, lung, and white blood cells. LDH four has one H subunit, three M subunits in the lung and skeletal muscle. And we already spoke about uh, LDH5, four M subunits that are in the skeletal muscle and the liver, right? We can actually use isozymes like this in uh, diagnostic tools. Here, we can actually detect a myocardial infarction in MI or heart attack, right? Uh, because of increased levels of creatine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase. Right, creatine kinase is another enzyme. It works with ATP, right? Uh, but here we're using lactate dehydrogenase as an example, right? When a myocardial infarction or an MI or a heart attack damages the heart muscle, there's an increase in the level of LDH1. You can detect that in blood serum, and that's how you can tell when someone's had a heart attack, right? I had a friend actually, like the other day, uh, right before she was about to go get her um, uh, 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 COVID vaccine, right? Right before she was about to go get her COVID vaccine, started like having like an, an anxiety attack about it. And when she uh, got there to the thing, to the place to get the, I guess here in Arlington, uh, we're doing it at the uh, Globe Life Stadium. Uh, no, actually they moved it over to AT&T Stadium now, Jerry Jones World. But before it was at Globe Life Stadium. And when she got there, she was having this, this what she called was an anxiety attack. But she told us that it was a, uh, uh, she told us it was an, a, an anxiety attack. But then she told us that she was having pain in her arm and 
she was having chest pains too, and she thought it may have been heartburn or something from like spaghetti sauce from the night before. And we're like, you know, that that doesn't sound right. You should probably go to the hospital and get checked out. And while she was at the hospital, they checked her levels of LDH1 in the blood serum, and they weren't elevated, so she didn't have a heart attack. I thought it was a heart attack, but I'm not a medical doctor. I just know that I just I just know that I've never had a problem with spaghetti sauce causing me pain in my arm. <laughs> so. But luckily, she didn't have a heart, have a heart attack, and she got home pretty easily, but uh, with no no issues. But that's an example of using LDH as a uh, diagnostic tool. All right. Elevated uh, LDH five uh, in uh, LD sorry, <laughs> elevated LDH five in the serum, right? That actually indicates liver damage uh, or disease, right? So. You can use all these to, to, to do a lot of diagnostic tests, right? Just in conclusion, the different isozymes of lactate dehydrogenase indicate damage to different organs in the body, right? Good stuff, good stuff. So there's some factors that, exa that, that, that affect enzyme activity, right? And uh, just like we were talking about before, you can use heat and, and pH and, and, uh, and other methods to denature proteins but proteins are just enzymes right they're functional enzymes that carry out reactions so or enzymes are just proteins right and they're function enzymes are proteins right they're just functional proteins that carry out reactions right so you can use things like temperature and ph right or the presence of inhibitors which we'll talk about later right to um uh, uh inhibit an enzymes uh, or affect an enzyme's activity you know how fast it catalyzes how fast it catalyzes a reaction so the example I have here is actually of thermophiles that are, uh, they can survive in temperatures, bacteria that can survive in temperatures from 50 degrees Celsius all the way to 120 degrees Celsius. That, excuse me, that's hot. That's 20 degrees higher than, uh, higher than boiling point. Uh, so I have a couple of different things to, to talk to mention here, right? Uh, if you didn't already know, 37 degrees Celsius is actually body temperature, right? And it's actually the, the, optimal temperature that bacteria could grow at. So being able to survive 50 degrees Celsius is pretty impressive. But then, all the way up to 120 degrees Celsius, this is the reason why when we autoclave things, or sterilize them in that big metal machine for like surgical equipment, right? We autoclave things. We autoclave it, and I don't know why I put it in two, two words, it's a single word, autoclave is two words. It's not two words, it's one word. We autoclave things, or sterilize things, oops, at 121 degrees Celsius, right? Remember I told you that earlier? We do that because extremophile bacteria can survive up to 120 degrees Celsius, and when you autoclave something, you're completely sterilizing it, right? Um, we're talking like killing 99.99999, like I think it's like 69%, right, is what the CDC says. It's called sterilization. And to achieve that, we have to do sterilization or treat whatever we're sterilizing one degree higher than the uh, the life range, temperature range of thermophile bacteria, which is 120 degrees. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to thermophile bacteria. The second thing about thermophile bacteria is that they actually are very valuable to us when it comes to biological research. They're the basis for what we call PCR. Does anybody know what PCR is? Of course you do. It's called the polymerase chain reaction. Um, so a long time ago, I think it was like 1990. <laughs> wow. It's funny saying that 1990 was a long time ago, but that was like 30 years ago. This dude named Kerry Mollis, right? And I think he was high on acid or something like that. But he figured out the fact that we could replicate DNA replication. Replicate DNA replication. We could simulate. No, not simulate. What's, we could do DNA replication on demand right, of target sequences of DNA by using the enzyme that's in these thermophiles, right, that does DNA replication. And the reason why we could do that is because we can control the enzyme by using heat, right, by using heat. So if you are trying to replicate DNA in a human using the, what we call polymerases, polymerases, not B, polymerases are the enzymes 
Polymerases are the enzymes that are in uh, living organisms, right, that are living at normal temperature. These polymerases, right, are responsible for doing DNA replication, doing DNA translation, DNA transcription, all that stuff, right? But since they live in, uh, since they exist inside us at 97 degrees, sorry, at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, right, they would die if we try to heat up their temperature any higher than that, and they become inactive. And so we can't be like, hey, human polymerase, go and replicate those DNA for me real quick. Start here and stop here, right? How do we do that? Well, we need to find, Caramel has figured this out, we need to find a polymerase that can be activated and inactivated using heat, right? Or temperature is what I mean, temperature. And there are thermophiles or, or, or extreme thermophile bacteria one specifically is called Thermus aquaticus. Aquaticus. And it has a polymerase that's heat stable, right? It's heat stable because it's living in freaking, you know, these heat vents here where the temperature is like 120 degrees, all right? So what we can actually do then is in PCR, we can have a strand of DNA, right? And we could target a section of that DNA, like a real important gene, and amplify that part, right? Or replicate that part of the gene, right? By taking the DNA genome, or the, the, the coding section of the DNA, out of the cell and putting it into a tube, along with this Thermus aquaticus polymerase, right? and some primers and using heat to control the uh, the uh, reaction right so what are the steps that's actually really simple pcr is right what you do is and you've heard a lot about pcr too because they used pcr was like the the premier uh uh covid19 diagnostic tool right that and the antigen test but the pcr test was far more reliable right because in theory you only need one literally not literally, but in theory, you only need one strand of DNA for it to work, right? And what happens is that the first step of DNA is that you need to denature it. Why do you need to denature it? Well, you need to, you need to denature it uh, in replication because you need the enzymes to spread apart. Sorry, not the enzymes, but the double helix to spread apart. The only way to do that, right, in the body is by using special enzymes, right, like helicase, topoisomerase, and what those do is they unzip the DNA so that the, the bases, the nitrogenous bases, right, the A's, the G's, the T's, and the C's, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, are exposed, right, so that a different enzyme can come in and make copies. Well, it's very hard for us humans in the lab to control helicase and topoisomerase, right, to denature the DNA enough so that we can get access to the DNA sequence. Well, what do you do then? Well, those DNA sequences are being held together by hydrogen bonds, right? The, D the double helix is being held together by hydrogen bonds. And if they're being held together by hydrogen bonds, what can disrupt those hydrogen bonds? We've talked about this many times already. It's heat. In fact, hydrogen bonds in water are broken at 100 degrees Celsius, right? Well, you can actually break the hydrogen bonds that are holding together a double helix of DNA, right? By heating the temperature up to 95 degrees Celsius, and it unzips the DNA. If we did that with our normal polymerases that are in our bodies, it would destroy those polymerases. But since we're using the polymerases that are in Thermus aquaticus, it can survive that. So after we unzip it, right, with the heat, we can bring the temperature back down to super low. And when it's low, we can add in little molecules called primers that tell the polymerase where to start replicating. And then we can bring the temperature back up a little bit to 72 degrees Celsius. And that is actually the optimal temperature for Thermus aquaticus' uh, polymerase to do DNA replication. This is huge, huge breakthrough. I mean, Kerry Mullis, my, my God, like he came up with this while he was high on something, acid or something like that. But, I mean, can you imagine? PSAR is like the basis, is like the, is the, the basis and the, the foundation for the last 33 decades of biological, biochemistry, molecular biology research. 
right? It's quite amazing. We'll talk a lot more in detail about PCR later on in life. Not later on in life, like next le next lecture, because we're going to be talking about nucleic acids next lecture. But just know that thermal file bacteria, thermal and enzyme activity is can be regulated, or sorry, can be affected using temperature. And this is one of the examples using the polymerase from Thermus aquaticus, right, to do polymerase chain reaction, okay? Next, moving on. Oh, temperature and pH effects, right? Well, if you are an enzyme, right, that's inside humans, like I said before, your optimal temperature for, acti for activity is 37 degrees, right? So here in this chart, you can see here at 37 degrees, the reaction rate is at its highest, right? If you're too low, it's low. If you're too high, it goes down too. So you want to be at 37 degrees Celsius, right, for the highest activity. You start losing activity at a temperature above 30, uh, above 50 degrees Celsius. Hell, if you bring it, excuse me, if you bring it up to 95 though, like in polymerase chain reaction, it's dead. The enzyme's dead. Other things that also affect uh, uh, the, the pH, I'm sorry, affect enzyme activity is pH, right? So uh, a good example of this is, okay, so we have an optimal pH of 7.4 actually in cells, most cells, right? And so enzyme activity goes up all the way to its peak at 7.4, and then it goes back down when it gets too basic. So a really good example of this is my, uh, my enzyme I studied back in grad school that I told you about in the last lecture, luciferase, right? The pH is actually what activates and deactivates that lid that makes luciferase allow the substrate luciferin to come in to make blue light. So this stuff is real, right? This stuff is real. So here's some pH values, right, for some optimum, uh, optimal activity, right? 7.4 is what I said a second ago, which is what, uh, uh, which is the uh, uh, the body's optimal pH. We have pepsin in the stomach, right? It breaks down pepside, peptide bonds, and its optimal pH is 1.5 to 2.0, which makes sense because it's in the stomach, right? The stomach is actually very acidic, right? That's why when you throw up after a night of drinking, it burns your throat because there's acid in your stomach, hydrochloric acid, I believe, right? Lactase, we talked about lactase already before. It's in the GI tract. It breaks down lactose into galactose and glucose, it's also slightly acidic because just past your your stomach into the GI tract, it starts beginning more. It starts to become more basic, but it's still slightly acidic. Sucrase, the enzyme in your small intestines that breaks down your sucrose into fructose and glucose, also slightly basic. Amylase, it's in the pancreas. It breaks down amylose, right? And uh, it's getting close to neutral pH. Urease in the liver, its substrate is urea, close to physiological pH. Now we're getting a little bit more basic. Remember I said as you get more and more in your small intestine, it becomes more basic. So trypsin, which breaks peptide bonds, which is basically breaking down the amino acids from the proteins you eat, right? Like your steak. Your steak goes in as amino acids that are in the shape of a protein, right? The, uh, the muscles that you eat from the steak, right? Like myos, uh, uh, myoglobin and such. And... Uh, and uh, actin and stuff like that, right? And myosin, and uh, you eat it, and you go. It goes into you chew it up, right? Which is the mechanical breaking up of those proteins. But it gets further broken down into its substituent amino acids when it gets into your your small intestines, which are slightly more basic than your stomach, right? Where trypsin goes and breaks those down into their substituent amino acids. The pancreas has lipases, right? Which break down the amino acids. Uh, sorry, the the uh, lipids, remember what I said about lipids in our previous lecture. Lipids are catalyzed, are base catalyzed reactions, right, to break them down. And then arginase breaks down arginine in the liver, and that's super basic at 9.7, right? So keep all those in mind. So we're the last thing we need to talk about is uh, enzyme inhibition. Um, there's a few different types of in enzyme inhibition, but what it, what it actually is that is uh, what enzyme inhibition actually is, is when normally you have the enzyme plus a substrate and you make the enzyme substrate complex. And then after that, like we said before, you get the enzyme back out again, 
as it was uh, before you started. So you can do it again, do the reaction again, and then you get a product, right? That's different from the substrate. You can actually inhibit an enzyme by adding an inhibitor, right? And if you inhibit that enzyme, that enzyme, you don't get a product at all. Okay, you don't get a product at all. This is actually the the basis for a lot of drug molecules, right? Uh, uh, back when I was in grad school, I was also do, doing developing drugs to uh, uh, drugs to combat cyanide poisoning and and nerve gases, nerve agents, and one of the things that we were doing was we were synthesizing molecules that were very similar to the, uh, the the nerve agent itself, right? Hoping that they would be able to block the nerve re nerve uh, the nerve agents or the cyanide, right, from uh, attacking its uh, its uh, its targets, right? It's a lot more complicated than that, but we were that's what we're doing the 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 goal was to create inhibitors uh for enzymes that were acting on uh that were acting that would make you sick from uh, uh acting with uh different nerve agents and, and cyanide so there are three types of normal inhibition here right there is competitive inhibition and then competitive inhibition is sounds exactly like it uh, it is exactly like what it sounds where a competitive inhibitor goes into the active site and blocks the substrate from going in there, right? It blocks the substrate from going in there, okay? Uncompetitive inhibition, right? What it does is that after a substrate has already gone into the active site and is going through the enzyme uh, reaction catalysis process and has formed the enzyme substrate uh, complex, an uncompetitive inhibitor will go in and bind to the entire enzyme substrate complex, rendering it useless, right? You don't get a product out of it anymore. And in non-competitive inhibition, the substrate tries to bind into its active site, but the non-competitive inhibitor, right, binds to some site outside the active site, changing the active site's uh, profile so that the substrate can no longer be uh, the substrate is no longer active inside the active site, right? And we're going to go through these in a lot more detail now. So now let's go through each one individually. Uh, we have competitive inhibition, right? And in competitive inhibition, like I was saying before, the structure of the inhibitor is very similar to that of the substrate, right? It competes with the substrate for the active site, but the interesting thing about it is that it can be, its effects can be reversed by increasing the substrate concentration. So here I have my enzyme. And if normal things are happening, I have my enzyme substrate complex forming after my enzyme goes into the active site, and I get the enzyme and product. And my enzyme is back to normal, back to the way it was before, and it can do more reactions. But if I do, if I add the inhibitor, right, I then get the enzyme inhibitor complex. But interestingly, in competitive inhibition, if I add more substrate right here, right, if I add more substrate, you can actually displace the inhibitor. And then I end up with the enzyme substrate complex again, and I'll get the product anyway, right? So that's actually a principle of Le Chatelier's, if you recall Le Chatelier's principle. You increase the substrate so that you get more of the product, so much that it overwhelms the concentration of the uh, inhibitor, right? So here's a more... Uh, here's, here's a more... Uh, more uh, graphical color picture here. We have the enzyme, right? Notice that the enzyme here is kind of like a trapezoid shaped, right? The substrate is oval shaped, but then it doesn't induce fit, right, model, where now it's all squared off and inside the active side of the enzyme. And then when it's done, everything returns back to normal again and we get the product, right? But if I add in an inhibitor, this guy right here, it also induced fits with the enzyme, making the inhibitor enzyme complex, enzyme inhibitor complex, right? And then I don't get the product. But if I add more of this stuff, more substrate, then I'll get the product, right? And that's the hallmark of competitive inhibition. Next, we have uncompetitive inhibition. And in non uncompetitive inhibition, we have the inhibitor binds only to the enzyme substrate complex, right? So here we have EI, all right? And 
the pro the funny thing is that in that <laughs> the funny thing is that when the substrate comes in, right, we still get the ES, the enzyme substrate complex. And the I is still separated, but the I won't bind to the ES, making the SI until the substrate is bound to the enzyme. Right? And once that's done, it's useless. Once you have the ESI complex, there's no products being made, and there's no enzyme coming back out again. That 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 is a lost cause now, right? And since that is a lost cause, it cannot be overcome by the addition of more substrate, right? It can't be overcome by the addition of more substrate, right? So in non-competitive inhibition, the substrate can't bind to the active site of the enzyme because the inhibitor, which is a completely different shape, you know, as opposed to what it is in a competitive inhibitor, uh, in, in a competitive inhibitor, the uh, inhibitor binds to another site on the enzyme that's not the active site, and it completely changes what the active site looks like, right? And when it does that, the substrate can no longer go in there, and you don't get an enzyme uh, uh, back out that's still active or a product. So this is, again, one of those that you cannot reverse the effects by adding more substrate, right? You cannot reverse those effects by adding more substrate. So just a quick review, right? For competitive inhibition, you can reverse the effect of the inhibitor by adding more substrate. Why is that? Because really here, in the competitive inhibitor, the inhibitor is taking occupying the spot of the substrate in the active site, and if you add more substrate concentration than inhibitor concentration, then it can overcome that concentration of inhibitor. But in both uncompetitive inhibition, you can't overcome it with more substrate because these are not concentration-based, right? Those types of inhibitions are not concentration-based. Uh, in uncompetitive inhibition, literally, once the enzyme substrate complex is bound by the inhibitor, it's no longer useful at all, and the enzyme dies, along with any hope of making that product from the substrate. And then in non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor radically changes the active site of the enzyme. So changing the, or increasing the concentration of the substrate won't change that back to normal again. And that's the reason why you can't reverse it with more substrate, right? And then we have one last, one very last type of inhibition, and this is irreversible inhibition, right? And this is the kind of inhibition, again, that can't be uh, reversed, right? And it's when a substrate attaches to uh, the uh, uh, active site, or it doesn't have to be the active site, but it attaches to the enzyme uh, permanently co with a covalent bond, right? And... Uh, it can no longer, uh, it can no, the, the enzyme can no longer be active because it actively destroys the, the enzyme, right? And a very good example of this kind of inhibitor is antibiotics, specifically uh, penicillin, which is known as the beta-lactam antibiotic. Beta-lactam antibiotic, right? It's known as that because of this here. We have this four-membered ring here right this four membered ring right there let me erase it so you can see it a little bit better and the interesting thing about it is that there's an amide bond right here in this ring this beta lactam ring right that's the beta lactam ring there's this bond right here right that's super unstable right this bond is super unstable because you recall the 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 uh when you have a Carbonyl, right? Its its favorite shape is trigonal planar, right, with a bond angle of 120 degrees. But you can see here that this bond angle is like approximately 90 degrees, right? It's approximately 90 degrees, so it's very small and very strained to what it needs, right? And I'm sorry, this got blocked out right here, but that says beta. Lactam. See, there's the tam part. So let's add in the lac. Yeah, beta lactam ring, right? And since that's so stable, I mean, so instable, right? Um, it's susceptible for uh, nucleophilic attack, which we haven't talked about before, 
But basically what happens is that in bacteria, uh, they have this thing called a peptidoglycan cell wall, right? And then enzyme, there's an enzyme that helps them make this peptidoglycan cell wall. And that enzyme is called glycopeptide transpeptidase. Glycopept glycopeptide transpeptidase has a serine right here, right, on its surface. And this serine, remember, has an OH group there, right? And when it gets close to this the beta-lactam ring of a, of a, of a beta-lactam antibiotic like penicillin, I'm going to draw this out real quick here. I'm just going to draw the beta-lactam part because that's the business end. happen is that the electrons right here from this OH group of the serine can come over here and attack this carbonyl carbon, right? And when that does that, it breaks this bond and it goes over to the uh, nitrogen, right? It breaks that bond and it goes over to the nitrogen. And when it does that, it permanently, covalently attaches itself to the serine. And what it does is that, in effect, it destroys that enzyme. That enzyme is no longer active, right? And that's how beta-lactam antibiotics work. And this is an irreversible inhibition, right? Because the enzyme is no longer inactive. It's, sorry, it's no longer active. It's completely been destroyed. And that's how penicillin works.